Committee on Health and Human Services will come to order. It's Tuesday, February 7th, and uh, we have one bill on the agenda today, and we do have a quorum present. So today we are going to be hearing Senate File 667, and I will uh, direct you to your folders as well. There are several testimonies and handouts in your folder. Please take a look at that. And with that, um, Senator Kunesh, did you uh, have an amendment you wanted to move before the bill? I do, um, um, Chair Mann, and I'm looking for it. I know I had it this morning. Um, I believe it's the A1, and it's just some language to um, to uh, get some conformity across and uh, correct some of the um, the language, like changing the number eight to the word eight, things like that. So, with that, I would move um, Senate uh, Amendment A1. Oh, uh, thank you, Senator. You can't move it because oh, you're that's not right. in the committee. That's right. Um, Senator Bolden, would you move the amendment? So move, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, any discussion on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, nay. The amendment is adopted. Uh, with that, Senator Kunesh, to your bill as amended. Thank you so much, um, Chair Mann, and to all of the um, committee members. I hope you listen with a, an open heart and clear ears as we talk about um, some of the tragedy in the history of our, uh, our American Indians and how we are working to ensure that we're preserving our uh, Native families. So throughout the history of the United States and Minnesota, Government and private practices have implemented intentional, horrific methods of removal and disconnection of Indian children from their families, from their culture, and from their tribes. Disconnection began with the federal policy of assimilation in 1819 through the passage of the Indian Civilization Act Fund, an act passed by the United States Congress March 3, 1819. The act encouraged benevolent societies, and I use that word benevolent uh, a little, with a little bit of distaste in my mouth, um, benevolent societies, both Protestant and Catholic organizations, to provide education for Native Americans and authorized financial incentives to stimulate the civilization process. In 1891 through the 20th century, the government used the Civilization Fund Act as authority to establish numerous Native American boarding schools. In 1869, the peace policy, an approach that advantaged humane interactions with Native people, allowed religious groups to run reservations across the American West, and that was initiated by President Ulysses S. Grant. These attempts by the federal government to end Indian tribes by assimilation and also led to the adoption of the American of the Indian boarding school policy. By 1879, forcible removal of Indian children from their homes for placement in government-sponsored boarding schools went on in earnest in an attempt to kill the Indian and save the children. Though we don't know how many were taken in total, by 1900, there were at least 20,000 children in American Indian boarding schools. And these children were removed mostly by force and by threat. And within 25 years, by 1925, that number had more than tripled. 60 plus thousand of our Indian children sent away to boarding schools. And I myself have family um, that were sent to the boarding schools. My grandfather's brother were taken from the Standing Rock Nation, sent to Carlisle in Pennsylvania, and when the boys tried to run away, and there's records of numerous times running away, um, they were always taken back. And it wasn't until my great uncle fell from a train, had his leg cut off, that they let the boys go home. These are the stories that we carry. And the people behind me, and so many of the others, have the same stories, have similar stories. There's not a family not, not affected by this. 
Though we don't, uh, let's see, then came the Indian Adoption Act of 1953, which is not so long ago. I mean, there are probably people, there are people in this room that were alive at that time. When the boarding schools began to die out in the 1950s and 60s, a new effort to disconnect Indian families took place. From 1958 to 1967, the federal government enacted a program called the American, or the Indian Adoption Project with the goal of white Americans now adopting native children. It was, it was officially efforts to lift obstacles that prevented native children from eligible adoption and allow them a better life. Testimony in support of the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act proved that approximately one in four Indian children had been placed in out of home or foster care nationally with the rate in some states such as Minnesota as high as 35%. So 35%, probably more of our native kids were taken from their families, put into out of, um, out of home placement, foster care, and eventually um, put up for adoption. Not, not in agreement by the family or the tribe. Many of those children were lost to their families and tribes through adoption to those non-Indian families. The effects of the trauma, separation from family, and disconnection from important cultural teachings caused by the boarding school and adoption era carries on today as families and tribes struggle to rebuild extended family and community relationships that help support raising children. A, 19, uh, a 2020 report from the Minnesota Department of Human Services indicated that American Indian children were 16.4% more likely than white children to be placed in out-of-home care. Finally, in response to the crisis and in recognition of the unique political status of our American Indians, the United States government enacted the Indian Welfare Act, ICWA, in 1978. In 1985, Minnesota enacted the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, MIFPA, as a su supplement to ICWA to bolster protections against child removal from families. It was amended in 2015 to add extra protections. Since 2018, tribal leaders in Minnesota have been intent in strengthening MIFPA after input from a wide variety of stakeholders, and as a result, tribal leaders tasked its attorneys to assess revisions to support this goal. Currently, there is a case before the U.S. Supreme Court that is challenging the validity of ICWA and the foundation that inspired MIFPA. The challenges are based on equal protection, anti-commandeering, and commerce clause arguments. MIFPA, MIPFA, MIFPA PA does not include a sub, um, severability clause and is currently a supplemental state statute to ICWA instead of a standalone statute. The anti-commandeering and commerce clause arguments needs to be addressed with the passage of Senate File 667. This proposal is the minimal necessary to ensure protection for our tribal children, families, and tribes. In response to the U.S. Supreme Court challenge, additional changes will follow in the subs uh, subsequent legislative year. This legislation, Senate File 667, incorporates the gold standard. It bolsters existing protections for ICWA and Minnesota statutes. The passage of this bill will continue to effectively work to protect Indian families, reduce litigation where possible, and provide more clarity so that tribes, counties, governmental agencies work under the same expectations and understandings of the rights and responsibility of our tribes, our families, and our communities. Minnesota is one of five states that have an Indian Family Preservation Act in place, and we lead the nation by enacting um, MIFPA in 1985. This bill codifies the Federal Indian Child Welfare Act into our state law and reinforces our state's recognition of the sovereignty of our tribal nations and our communities in Minnesota. The bill that you have in front of you is the culmination of hundreds of hours of work, of discussion, and collaboration between Minnesota's tribes, the experts, practitioners, and the legislature. 
In 2018, tribal leaders in Minnesota envisioned a goal to strengthen MIFA after input from various key stakeholders. And as a result, tribal leaders tasked their attorney to assess revision and support this goal. The MIFPA Tribal Attorney Workgroup has engaged with various stakeholders during the drafting process, including but not limited to the Minnesota Department of Human Services, the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators, the Minnesota County Attorneys Association, the Association of County Attorneys, and the Association of Minnesota Counties. Members, other states are once again watching and waiting looking for an updated MIFPA to incorporate as model legislation and enshrine protections in their states. And so with that, I ask you to support this bill um, and listen very carefully to the testifiers, some who have driven very great district to be here in support of this, um, of this bill. Thank you, Senator. Um, I was kind of taken aback by that 35% number. That's quite egregious. Very so. Yeah. Um, with that, we will go to uh, our testifiers who are on Zoom. We'll start with Larissa Littlewolf. You could introduce yourself for the committee and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the community. Shingwa Kun Sindigal, Mekanak and Dude, Gaza Gasaj, Mekag and Dunjaba. My name is Larissa Littlewolf and I come to you both as a professional and a relative. Um, professionally, I'm the Associate Director of the Tribal Training and Certification Partnership at UMD. As a person, I am an Ojibwe mom, auntie, cousin, sister, community member, and relative. I have worked in tribal child welfare for over 10 years now, and I have seen the significant impact that both the ICWA and MIFPA have, a, have had on families and within communities. I have seen Indigenous families unified, people reconnected to their culture, and I have seen healing. I have witnessed communities strengthened by families who have healed. I have witnessed renewed relationships and renewed community ties. I have seen cultural healing to help create strong and healthy families. I have witnessed county agencies providing active efforts to families, and I have seen county agencies be out of compliance with both ICWA and MIFPA. And that's when I've witnessed relatives and youth being lost to the system. I often wonder who our community lost and what gifts were taken when those children were placed away from their relatives and community. Our children are our future leaders, doctors, teachers, nurses, language carriers, culture carriers. They are future spiritual leaders and our future politicians. I have seen what happens to indigenous families when ICWA and MIFPA are not applied or not followed. I have seen that reasonable efforts are not enough to help heal the historical and contemporary traumas that exist in our communities due to the genocidal practices of the U US government. Indigenous children were targeted and removed from their families and communities through the boarding school era, the Indian Adoption Project, and by the foster care system, all which are government practices. Indigenous children were removed from their homes and placed in white homes in an attempt to civilize them and assimilate them. These practices are documented in US history. There's propaganda and historical documents that show Indigenous babies being stolen. Our children were taken and no one knew where they went. When Indigenous children were forcefully removed, they were not allowed to practice their culture or their language. They were not allowed to know their relatives or their family. They did not get to know the love of their parents or the love of their community. They did not get to feel the cultural healing within our ceremonies and ways of being. This is why ICWA was passed in 1978, because large numbers of Indigenous children were being taken from their parents, extended families and communities by state child welfare and private adoption agencies. 25 to 35% of all Native children were being removed, with 85% being placed outside of their families and communities, even when there were relatives who were able to care for them. MIFPA was passed in 1985 as a way to strengthen support for American Indian families and children here in Minnesota. Supporting this bill supports Indigenous families throughout the state and continues to support, continues support for our tribal nations now and in the future that lives with their children. Right, supporting the bill recognizes that the system was not set up for American Indian families, and in fact, it was set up to assimilate our American Indian families and target the future of their livelihood, which is their children. Minnesota is still number one in disproportionate rates of American Indian children in out-of-home placement. Significant work still needs to be done, and this bill supports that work. 
Supporting the strengthening of MIFPA supports the Indigenous youth right to know where they're from, to know their culture, and to know their family, and to be health, happy, healthy, and whole. And I ask for your support of Bill SF-667. Miigwech. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Little Wolf. Next, we have Emily Esther Rivera. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Emily Rivera and I am from Bemidji, Minnesota. It is a true honor to, to be here today and to be able to speak in front of you so that I can offer support for Senate File 667. Um, I live in a county with, um, I would say some of the highest placement rates in the nation. The most recent uh, 2020 child welfare report that was put out by um, DHS um, indicates that 668 of the 777 children in out-of-home placement, not corrections placements or mental health placements, but just in child welfare placements alone, that's 86% were American Indian. Um, I'm sure there's all kinds of statements as to why, but the why is why I've been working in this field for close to 20 years. I currently serve as a member of the Guardian Ed Lightum Board for the state of Minnesota, where we have been able to um, support our staff in the creation of uh, an incredible uh, ICWA division um, that has created just along with the um, UMD, um, impressive, impressive um, training that I think will, will be just revolutionary. But in order for us to do this work, the support that I could have used when I worked in child welfare um, for for a tribe, for Leech Lake, is, is law that such as this that really does emphasize what ICWA means to tribes. I spent nine years in intake and assessment and three years as a guardian ad litem. I have heard thousands, tens of thousands of reports overseen thousands of assessments, interacted with all of the counties in the state, and their their approach is not uniform. Um, having MIFPA codified will help. It will help to support the staff who are looking to, to support tribes and the supervisors and, and will provide guidance to those who are still fighting against it because there is still active active efforts to undermine the tribe's right to exercise their sovereignty, the treaty rights to ensure that their children have the best opportunity for survival. The best opportunity for survival is already existing. The tribes have ways of being, ways of doing that I was blessed to learn from elders and community members who took the time to say, this is what we need for our children. This piece of legislation, I believe, really reflects that work, that input, that guidance that is so important when we're making these decisions. Because as our the previous uh, speaker, Ms. Larissa Littlewolf said, all, all of the things that she said, all of the forms of extermination that have gone forward are continuing through the processes of removal, unnecessary removal. We need this. I've seen in working um, even as a paralegal, the work that is needed to, to support tribes is, is unnecessary. The cost to the tribes to be able to assert the best interests of the children their families and the tribe. The cost is extraordinary. There isn't extra funding. There isn't extra support. Tribes shouldn't be in this alone. This, this Senate file supports tribes. And I want to thank all of the people who participated in developing this because it, it honors what 
what already exists and the strength that already is. And I just, I feel like if, if that, that guidance and that direction has existed for generations, it's time for us as community members, as government leaders to, to hear and, and to follow this direction. And I really appreciate the extent of work that got us to this point. So I appreciate all your consideration and I want to let you know, I full heartedly support this uh, Senate file. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rivera. Next up, we have Lori Lynn York, also on Zoom. Please introduce yourself and proceed. So good morning, everyone. My name is Lori York. I'm the, currently the Executive Director for White Earth Nation, and I'm also the ICWA Advisory Council Co-Chair. I wanted to first of all thank you for, your, for the opportunity to provide testimony today. So in 2018 and again in 2019, the American Indian Child Welfare Advisory Council, the American Indian Chemical Dependency Council, and the American Indian Mental Health Council came together to discuss issues impacting American Indian children and families. During those tribal visioning sessions, a recommendation came forward to strengthen the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act. As Senator kunish Padin has mentioned, uh, currently, there's a case before the US Supreme Court that is challenging ICWA, which is the foundation for MIFBA. The challenges are based on equal protections, anti-commandeering and the Commerce Clause arguments. MIFBA does not include a severability clause and is currently supplemental to ICWA instead of a standalone statute. The anti-commandeering and Commerce Clause arguments can, address, can be addressed with the passage of the state law. The proposed changes are necessary to ensure protections for Indian children and families and tribes. Specifically, the United States Supreme Court challenge is really a, an attack on our tribal sovereignty, and it will impact many, many services provided to our, our children and families and for all of our tribal nations. It's, a, it's really important, and I cannot st stress enough that it really is at the roots attack on our sovereignty. This year's legislative proposal incorporates the gold standard, existing protections of ICWA into the Minnesota statutes to continue to effectively work at protecting Indian families and reduce litigation where possible and provide more clarity to everyone involved at the same, with the same expectations and understanding of rights and responsibilities. It also ensures the protections of ICWA are protected so tribes and Indian families do not lose any more children in the event that the federal law is struck down. Minnesota is one of five states that has an Indian Family Preservation Act in place, and other states look to Minnesota and specifically to MIFPA to have um, as, as a model for other states to incorporate. incorporate. And it's really important to know that um, tribes, we have uh, ICWA throughout the whole United States. We have, um, uh, like I said, there's five states that have a MIFPA, but we are really concerned about all of our children that will be or could be impacted um, by the challenges brought forward on ICWA. So Minnesota is in a, in a better place than most, but we have to do everything possible to ensure that our children are protected. And if MIFPA is going to be used at a national level um, and, and looking at that the importance of that law, that could impact the rest of our children throughout the nation. So it is really critical and important that we we move forward this legislative session to ensure that we have the best MIFPA in place and the best MIFPA possible for other states to potentially use. The American Indian Child Welfare Advisory Council brought to tribal leaders' attention during the tribal state agreement that there was a recommendation from the tribal visioning session to strengthen the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act. Tribal leaders in Minnesota envisioned a goal to strengthen MIFPA after input from various key stakeholders. As a result, tribal leaders tasked its attorneys to assess the revisions to support the goal. The MIFPA Tribal Attorney Work Group has engaged with various stakeholders during the drafting process and included but not limited to the Minnesota Department of Human Services, the Minnesota Association of County Social Services Administrators, the Minnesota Counties Attorneys Association and the Association of County Attorneys, the Association of Minnesota Counties. 
So while we had, while the tribal MIFPA work group had got to work right away, when we had the challenges of the ICWA Supreme Court case, this expedited that process a little bit quicker. Um, the recommendations from the tribal leaders came in the years of 2018 and 2019. But as the as we've seen the, the U.S. Supreme Court take on the ICWA um, challenges, um, we really got down to work for the last year. And um, in that process, we were attempting to be as inclusive as possible to let folks know and be aware that we were working on strengthening MIFA. We wanted to be inclusive to what their concerns or changes might be in that process. The preservation of the Indian Child Welfare Act and the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act is of ongoing and critical importance for the Indian tribes in Minnesota because of the out-of-home placement uh, rates and numbers remaining high. Senate File 667 ensures that all provisions of ICWA are expressly stated in the Minnesota law to ensure continued protections for Indian families and tribes in Minnesota in the event that ICWA is found to be in violation of the Commerce Clause or is found to be commandeering state agencies. There is little, if any, changes to the actual practice in Senate File 667. It is strengthening MIFPA. The American Indian Child Welfare Advisory Council is in support of Senate File 667. We respectfully ask that you vote in favor of Senate File 667 during the current legislative session and that you support our future legislative efforts on these issues. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. York. Next up, we have a um, recorded testimony from Robert Larson, the Lower Sioux County Council President. Having some technical difficulties. Okay. So while we get that figured out, we can move on to our first testifier who is here, and that would be Chairman Farron Jackson. Person Wickland, committee members, I'm Robert Deuce Larson, president of the Lower Sioux Indian Community, and I thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of Senate File 667. One of the greatest treasures of any nation is its children. The very Dakota word for children signals how important and highly regarded they are to Dakota people. Our word for children is Wakayanja, which loosely translates in English as the sacred ones. Our children are vital to our customs, traditions, values, and sovereignty. The Wakayanja are our future, next in line to continue passing down the knowledge and wisdom of our teachings, our wechoha, that way of life, to the next generation and for generations to come. Tribes have a unique political status with the United States. Unfortunately, under the guise of this status, our recent history has seen Indian children being disconnected from their tribes for various reasons. Federal assimilation policies encompassed the boarding school era, a time when many Indian children were forcibly removed from their homes, their families, their tribes, to be stripped and shamed of their identity and indoctrinated in the way of life that was foreign to them, triggering another wave of historical trauma that has ripple effects to this day. In 1985, Minnesota passed the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, or MIFPA, a supplemental law to the Indian Child Welfare Act, or ICWA. Testimony during the time of ICWA's passage in 1978 indicated Indian children were placed in foster care and adoptive homes at a rate of 19 times higher than non-Indian children. This crisis was addressed in the ICWA and MIFPA. The very statutory language of MIFPA recognizes that Indian children are the future of the tribes and are vital to their very existence. To date, there continues to be a disproportionately high number of Indian children moved from their homes to, into non-Indian placements. As a foster parent, my family has helped with 15 children, with two resulting in adoption. It's important that tribes have 
they say in placement preferences so that children in foster care do not lose ties to their culture and community. And I'm not advocating this simply because of the position I hold. It's because I'm living it. Since 2018, tribal leaders in Minnesota have sought to strengthen NIFPA and tasked the ICWA Advisory Council to address this endeavor. Subsequently, the ICWA Advisory Council referred the revision process to an attorney work group for the tribal nations. This work group incorporates the existing gold standard protections afforded under ICWA and makes MIFPA a standalone versus supplemental law to ICWA. And on behalf of the Lower Sioux Indian community and its council, I want to relay my appreciation for Senator Kunish authoring Senate File 667, as these initial revisions support the community's desire for a more strengthened MIFPA. Padami Adel, thank you. Thank you to President Larson. Next up, we have a Chairman Farron Jackson, Sr. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Okay, uh, Buju, Buju, uh, Farron Jackson, Sr., Leech Lake Tribal Chairman, Gi Wade In, my Ojibwe name, which means North Wind. I'm just happy to be here and thank you for giving me some time to speak this morning. Uh, I just want to touch on a few of the issues that kind of already been spoken here. You know, uh, you know, the the United States Constitution recognizes the unique political status of Indian tribes and Indian people. ICWA and MIFPA are based upon the political status of the Indian child as a member of a federally recognized Indian tribe, not the child's race. The federal government enacted ICWA in 1978 in response to an overwhelming amount of testimony about the devastation caused to Indian tribes and families by unjustified removal of Indian children from their families, tribes and communities, by state and county and private agencies and individuals. Minnesota enacted MIFDA in 1985 to provide greater protections to Indian tribes and families in Minnesota. Testimony when ICWA was enacted indicated that one in four children have been placed in, in auto home placement nationally with some states including Minnesota being as high as 35%. Those placements were overwhelmingly outside of the Indian community. When ICWA was enacted, Congress took several weeks of testimony from many, many tribal leaders as well as individual Indian people who had lost family members and who had themselves been lost. In addition to the emotional devastation of losing family and community members, tribal sovereignty was weakened by the loss of children who are a valuable resource and vital to the continued existence of, welfare, of the welfare of the tribe. MIFPA and ICWA are still needed as out of home placement in Indian countries continues to be high in Minnesota and across the country. For example, in 2018, the rate per thousand of children entering foster care was the highest for the American Indian children at 38.4 out of a thousand, compared to 8.8 .8 for African American and 3.1 for white Caucasian children. I just want to talk about my personal experience with ICWA here. It goes back into the 60s. I was born in 1955 and I come from a family of eight children and we were living in our tribal homelands. And, and my two younger brothers were removed at the age of four and five from our home in the 60s before the ICWA or MIFA laws were established. And it, it, caused, it caused a lot of trauma in our family. You know, and, and it, we can still feel it today. And you know, my, my two biological brothers were removed and placed in, in home after home, sometimes separated, sometimes reunited in, in farm homes throughout northern Minnesota. Our, our, our parents were never notified where, the, where my brothers were at, you know, and, and when my brothers were, were released, when they were 18 years old, they came back home to find to find our family, and and they were angry. They were angry at the system, <clears throat> and they were angry at at my parents because they felt my parents didn't love them, 
and and it it, it caused a it caused a lot of dysfunction in our family. And even even today, even though they're you know they're my bi biological brothers, they they we kind of feel like strangers in a way when we're when we're together, you know. And so that love is not as strong as as, as it would be if, if we would all have been able to stay together. He tells stories about being in these farm homes out in these rural areas when my brother is trying to run from these homes and to open up their bedroom windows and they were they were laced with chicken wire. They tried to run away to come home. They couldn't. So these are things that families experience, you know, this trauma. And it, you know, you try to heal and move forward. But sometimes these, it's like a post-traumatic stress in them, like the horrors of war. You can never forget them. And, you know, and they never go away. So you just, you try to move on as best as you can. And tribal leaders, elders, you know, we don't want to see this happening anymore in our communities. You know, our, the Indian people are, are very unique in our ways. We're, 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 we're part of animal clans, you know, like the bear, the wolves, all the clans, you know, they have offspring and they stay together. And Indian people have to stay together. You know, even though we're 1% of the state population in Minnesota and the United States, you know, that's, that's a very significant number is 1%. You can't divide and split them up. They have to be with their, with their family, relatives, and stay in their communities to, to keep their identity. You know, me and my wife, we've been blessed with being foster parents for over 30 years. You know, we've had over 50, 60 children come through our home in, in 30 years, and, and we're still friends with these kids. So, uh, you know, that's what I'm, that's what I, I, I try not to get too emotional, but it, it's, I'm very passionate about my feelings, and I just, I'm not afraid to express them, and, and these, uh, this S, SF667 file is, is very important that we, we look at it that way, you know, from the eyes of the Anishinaabe people, that's, that's where the, the real love for these children come from. So I just want to thank you uh, all for uh, taking time to, to listen to me speak today, and uh, I appreciate it very much. Miigwech. Thank you, Chairman Jackson. Thank you for sharing that story with us. Um, and I think we appreciate your passion and your emotion. And quite frankly, we should all be that emotional about this um, because the trauma that you're sharing and that everyone up there has been sharing is, is quite significant. So we appreciate it. Miigwech. Um, next up, we have Chairman Kevin Dupuy. Did I say that right? Please introduce yourself and uh, proceed. Madam Chair, Committee Members. Uju Naganimus and Disna Kaz Nagachuan Anga Nujaba Megisi Dodam. We do Kawashu Nungum Dashkutu and Waishi Chigian, Akini Nagani Made Mani Duk, Akini Nagamani Duk, Wabanung Jawanung Nigaminu Giwedinung. My name is Kevin Dupi. I'm the chairman of the Final Act Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. In today's age, we use things as, as terms as sovereignty with the understanding uh, the term sovereignty comes from a dictionary. Um, pretty much basically meaning the right to govern yourself. But as a Anishinaabe man, we are tied to the earth in different ways, and it's hard for people to understand that principle. But it's a right not just to govern yourself. It's a right to live. It's a right to have a spiritual language. It's a right to be tied to everything that exists out there. And with the Anishinaabe people, our language is spiritual. We believe everything has a spirit, inanimate, inanimate objects. And with that, with the child, it's their right. And our teachings believe that the children choose their parents. The children choose their parents. It's a hard concept for people to understand that, that the children choose their parents. And we as Anishinaabe people are bound to that child or to them children to protect them in a manner that most people can't fathom. 
just like any other human being, has a simple right to protect their children. The elephant in the room, and I say this with no ill intentions towards anybody that's here, is genocide. The simple principle of stripping a culture or a belief system from a people is a form of genocide. For 530 years, people have been telling us what is right for us, what is best for us. Our people have paid in many, many ways through the land sessions, through the treaties, stripping of our lands, stripping of the ground, and paid in blood, and taking of our children. When the trees are protected, we are protected. When the water's protected, we're protected. When the animals are protected, we're protected. Because we are tied to each and every living thing that exists out there. No one man or group of people had the right to deny us our right to exist as who we are as a people. Our children are our future, and that goes for any society. Their children are their future. But by, by removing children, again, the simple principles of genocide are taking a culture away from them. Our job is obligated to the ones who came before us, to what we do today, to ensure that our children have a future. And when our children have a future, that means we still exist as Anishinaabe men. And it's important for the understanding that the term sovereignty that's thrown around on a daily basis with the misunderstanding of exactly what that means. The rights of all human beings and to understand there is only one race of people and that's the human race. The separation of ethnicity, cultural ways, rights of beliefs, and to stand and look at what is going on in front of us as people. We can, we can use the United States as the most powerful nation in the world. The most powerful nation in the world. And as a veteran, I have the right to say this. They can go and stop genocide in any place in the world. But we won't stop it here. The ones who sat before me, <clears throat> when we talk about our relatives, we're told that any time that we speak our language, our relatives come forward from the beginning. So in this room today, all our relatives from the beginning are here. And watching us, what we do today, as not just tribal leaders, but as man, as Anishinaabe, in the rooms at Dakota and Lakota people, our brothers and sisters, that we do the right thing that we stand just like we stand for any other human being, just like we stand for any process that exists out there. But it is our job as human beings, and it's my job as a tribal leader, and it's my job as an Anishinaabe man to protect our children, to protect our future, to ensure that there is a future. In SF <clears throat> State File 667 ensures that we, we get determined what's right for our children. That we get to determine what's right for our people, not somebody else. And I think everybody up there, and I'm probably some of you are parents, aunties, grandmas, Sisters, <clears throat> we as human beings need to do the right thing. And it's as simple as we protect our future. That's all 
no matter what ethnicity you are. But we're here today because the encroachment, the continuation of out of home placement, and the continuation of principle of genocide. Because every time a child is taken away from their people, they don't get to learn that culture or that language. It's hard to sit <clears throat> here today and know that when I leave here today, I'm going to go back home and I'm going to see it again. But the biggest issue here is as a tribal leader, when families come up and say, why? Why? None of you get to hear that because it's not part of your world. This is our world on a daily basis. On a daily basis. And we talk about historical and generational trauma. I can feel it behind me. I can feel the people sitting behind me and the one that's next to me on how they feel. Because as Anishinaabe or indigenous people, we are all part of that. So the pain I feel is the pain that they feel. And we will continue to feel this pain until there's a change to where people understand that the ones who are sitting in front of you today are also parents, are also grandparents, are also uncles and aunties and also have children. Just like each and every one of you would defend with the utmost tenacity for the life of your child or your relative. And we have, and we will continue to defend that principle with the utmost tenacity because we have to ensure that we have a future for our people. <clears throat> and it's to the point of we see you. Do you see us? Hope Miigwech. Thank you, Chairman Dupi. Um, next up, we have Nisha Dupi. And members, if we could silence our cell phones, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senate Committee for inviting me here today. I'm here to speak in, oh. Just a little closer to the microphone. Sorry and introduce that. yourself, please, thank you. Buju Manomigwani Kwe Indijna Ka Zawasasi Nindodem Mekanak Wajuding Minawa Nagachi Wanang Indunjaba. My name is Nisha Dupuy. I'm a mother, a daughter, a sister, a relative, and one day I hope to be a good ancestor. I'm a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Band of Ojibwe and a descendant of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. I'm also a social worker. I've worked in child protection as both a tribal and county social worker for the last decade. Currently, I'm a supervisor of the Indian Child Welfare Unit in St. Louis County. When I was preparing for this testimony, a colleague of mine, he said, you'll do great. You've lived and breathed ICWA and MIFPA for the last 10 years. As I think about that statement, I wish I would have corrected him. I've lived this my entire life. I've had the opportunity to grow up in my family, in my community, knowing who I am, my cultural stories, and my traditional songs. Something my ancestors didn't have the opportunity to know or do. They didn't know the love we feel when we're embraced by our elders. They didn't know the joy we feel singing our traditional songs and knowing our ceremonies and they didn't know the warmth we feel from our community. That's why this legislation is critical, for our children to feel that connection. As a supervisor, I've been witness to the positive outcomes for Indigenous families when we focus on children's inherent right to be with their family. 
in their tribe, and in their community. I've seen those outcomes when our judge, when our Indian Child Welfare Court judge holds the space for the gold standard to social work practice. When we focus on tribally led case planning from the earliest possible point, inclusive of active efforts, inclusive of cultural practices and norms. When I was a line worker, I worked with many families, but I specifically think of one mother who had lost other children through a termination of parental rights. I would call her and text her every week out of obligation of the statutory requirements. She would sometimes respond to me, but we were never able to meaningfully connect. Finally, I sent out my text message and she responded. She said that she was out of state and she needed to get home. She described her situation. It was through active efforts that we were able to provide her a way home. A week later, she was in a facility. A month after that, her daughter was placed with her. Four months later, the, social, the tribal social worker and I were looking for a furniture for her very first apartment. She successfully reunified with her, her daughter. I occasionally get to see her, always with her child. My dad says, the quality of our relationships directly impacts the quality of our lives. Our indigenous children deserve a quality life feeling their connection. The support of Senate Bill 667, the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, is an opportunity to reaffirm Minnesota's commitment to the protection of Indian, fam Indian children through the preservation of Indian families. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. P. Next, we have Gertrude Bukanaga. right into this here thing yep yeah welcome to the committee please introduce yourself and proceed yeah uh, I hope this is can you hear me uh, well my name is Gertrude Bukanaga I was raised on the White Earth Reservation I'm a member there my Indian name was Migazi and um, and uh, I lived there, and I lived the life of an Indian person with all the rules and regulations that we could not speak our language, we could not practice our culture, we could not learn our history, and um, we couldn't, uh, you know, uh, learn our own uh, spirituality. That's our ceremonies in that. And uh, Indian people are very spiritual. We have about uh, 50, 20, 30, 40 ceremonies that we do. And um, we couldn't do that. My mother used to hang blankets on a window so nobody would know what we did or that we were having a ceremony. We could not go to school and tell our teachers or anyone what we did at home. So we grew up not trusting people because they would report us to the government that we could not speak our language or culture, but we did. In 1946, my mother had an accident and passed to the spirit world. We were sent to uh, boarding schools. There were seven children in my family. The youngest at that time was a baby. She was about six, seven months old. Her, she was born on January 1st, 1945. And, um, so they, and uh, so they sent five of us to boarding school. The youngest person that went to boarding school was four years old. She turned five on December 14th. So there was five of us that went to boarding school. My sister Donna, me, and Teresa, 
and I had two brothers that went to boarding school. We were kept from our, our parents, our grandparents, our relatives, and our friends. We did not go home that year, so we never saw our family members. And in 1947, we did go home. I don't know how we got to go home that year, but we went home to spend time with my baby sister and baby brother who were raised by my uncle. There was two of them, my baby sister Anita and John. And in, in August of 1947, we went back to boarding school and we never went home after that. We were kept from our, 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 our dad, our grandparents, our aunts and uncles, cousins, family members that we grew up with when we were young. So families are really important. I went to college and I worked in several colleges and then I worked at St. Catherine's College for six years. I learned a lot while I was there. And uh, I was recruited to, uh, I, to work for the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe for two years, so I went on sabbatical. And um, I, it was a real challenge to go up and work on the tribes because of the, fa you know, because of the, the community not having uh, electricity, phones and other things. And the Indian people used to hitchhike just to get an education, a GED. We didn't have the kind of education that we should have. But uh, so after I left there, I, I, worked to, I went to work for the Minneapolis Public Schools, St. Paul Public Schools. And then I, we, I, we started a number of organizations and Upper Midwest Indian Center recruited me to be with them and uh, uh, to work with them because of the, you know, what uh, Upper Midwest Indian Center was created. It is one of the first agencies in uh, Minnesota in the nation that worked to, improve the, worked to improve the lives of Indian people who were moving to the urban area. And uh, when I started working at Upper Midwest Indian Center, uh, they had a reunification program that was funded by uh, the federal government. And that was, they had the, the system had, a, had a, a program where it was really difficult for the children who were in foster care and for the parents who had their children in foster care. And the reunification program was to uh, meet, uh, meet, have the children meet their parents. And you know, the system was not good at that time. Uh, and uh, the Indian Child Welfare Act, there was two laws that were passed in 1978 when I was working for the tribe. Uh, president Jimmy Carter was a president and Walter Mondale was the vice president. And Walter Mondale worked with the tribes in, in Minnesota and he helped get these laws passed. The 19, there's two laws, the Indian Child Welfare Act and the American Indian Freedom of Religious Act. The American Indian Freedom of Religious Act recognizes the culture, the spirituality, and land issues for Indian people in, this, in, the, in the nation. And the Indian Child Welfare Act was to keep families together. But no one was following these laws when I started working for Upper Midwest Indian Center. The, the out-of-home placement plan, they were just terrible. I meant people had to go to different places. Some had to go to treatment. Some had some kind of special service that they had. But, you know, uh, people don't follow laws. <laughs> and uh, last night, I looked at the, Indian Ch the Minnesota Family Preservation Act. 
and I thought, gee, we're, we're, I'm going to go testify for a, you know, for a law that's really needed for Indian people, Indian parents, just to keep our families together. I know what it means to be separated from families. And I know I, I, in boarding school, we survived though. And I'll tell you why we survived. Because we grew up, you know, uh, knowing that it was important to be a family member. So each of the Indian students at, in the boarding school, we supported each other. We, um, <laughs> we never told on each other. We never told anybody if somebody was doing a ceremony. We never said nothing because we shouldn't. We were taught not to do that, not to tell anybody. But we couldn't practice our culture. We couldn't practice our language. We couldn't uh, do our, our spirituality. The system decided what you should do, where you should go to church at, uh, in, you know, what you could do and what you couldn't do. But we became a family. And um, I went to school with, uh, you know, a lot of leaders like Dennis Banks. And uh, I went to his court hearing. And, you know, his court hearing was thrown out because of the system. You know, the system... Uh, um, I mean, we're, we're making some, uh, we're looking at some laws today. And when I started, uh, uh, no one was practicing the system and we are still having a problem with uh, Indian children that are in out of home placement, that are in these counties. I can tell you today, I learned a lot. I, I have an, uh, I have an MSW, uh, independent social work degree. I went to, uh, I studied every night I do research. And, uh, and when we worked with the families, they had discriminatory policies in each county and they are still there. And it's still at DHS too, because uh, you know, there are people that get hired and, and you know, they're not treated right. And so if the professional people are not treated right, how are they going to treat the children? So as I look at it today and look at the act, the Minnesota Indian Preservation Act, the Indian Child Welfare Act, the American Indian Freedom of Religious Act, that's one of the most important acts, the American Indian Religious Freedom of Religious Act, because in that act, they recognize the culture of American Indian people. And we're very spiritual people. And no one understands the, the laws. Like they don't understand why people sing to the drum, why babies start kicking their feet when they're listening to a drum and at a powwow. You just look at them. Because the drum is the heart of the earth. That when the, when the mother is, when the baby is in the utero, they can hear the mother's heartbeat. So when they hear that drum, they know. So our culture is very, very important, our spirituality. So people should be studying the American Indian Freedom of Religious Act. Because, uh, you know, people came to this country so they could practice their country. You know, they could practice their religion wherever they came from. The Jewish people, we have a number of the Swedish people, the German people. You know, we all have important cultures, the African-American, and my family is multicultural, inter interracial, interculture. I have grandchildren that live on seven uh, reservations, tri seven tribal nations, they're enrolled. And um, we have to look at the descendants of, of the people in 1934, under the Re Indian Reorganization Act, the, that's a federal law. They recognize all members and descendants. You know, people that, so we, we really need to uh, look at how people are going to be trained. And we need to look at how DHS is trained and how the counties are trained. 
because you know there's there's still a lot of issues that have to be take, taken up. And I looked at the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act last night and I thought, well, culture is very important, education is very important, family is very important. So um, I could talk longer, but <laughs> they said you only have two or three minutes, so I think I've had my three minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Bakanaga. Um, that was our last testifiers. Members, are there any questions for the testifiers? Senator Rucky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this would be for the uh, bill's author, I would gather. Um, in the latter part of the bill, we there's talk about some grants. Has there been a fiscal note, or is there a fiscal note coming on this? Do we know where financially where this lands? Um, thank you for the question. Actually, there is no need for a fiscal note. This is all policy change, and so um, when we re requested our fiscal note, they said there would be there would be no um, fiscal note. Senator Rucky. Members, any other questions to the author regarding the bill, Senator Abler? Well, thank you, Senator Kunish, for bringing this bill, and I'm happy to be a co-author on there. I've uh, in the and maybe just the history of how tribes have been treated in Minnesota is nothing short of appalling or shameful or just horrifying. Uh, and I just, <laughs> if I quit reading the history, I feel okay, because I kind of forget. But uh, you read any history, and it's nothing good about it. Uh, back in the 1800s, when they wouldn't give them food, and the whole Indian agent thing, and uh, tragedies of so many times, and what uh, just men and women were driven to do to simply survive, uh, which was misinterpreted and uh, just it's horrible. And I, I want to thank you for bringing it forward. I, I am compelled by each testifier, and as I listen to each one, I learn something new. Um, and it just brings tears to my eyes. Uh, in... Um, I was privileged to be the chair of this committee for a while. We took a run at trying to fix some of this. Uh, I don't think we got very far. Uh, I know in 2011 or 12, uh, in a different time, we were able to uh, turn over the social services to White Earth uh, to be on their own to the, frankly, chagrin of some of the people who didn't want that to happen. And I think that set in place a cascade of other tribes being able to do what they need to do. And I absolutely and behind you in your efforts to make it better. Um, and so, um, I don't know what you plan to do today, but um, certainly you want to protect what you have. And it sounds like this is simply recodifying the sum of the federal and the state uh, laws. But I don't think that we're doing well enough. And I don't know what my county does. I imagine they try. Um, and they're as good as any county in making their efforts, I suppose. I've not actually specifically asked them what they do. Uh, but I know that across the system, it's not going like that we would want. And, and so I think it's good to get this put to bed and get this passed so it's secure. So if whatever, I don't even know why they're challenging at the Supreme Court. I just don't understand that. But uh, more pain for more good people who have had no reason to suffer as much as they have. Uh, but going forward, um, we have four years here uh, in this cycle, and I hope that in the next iteration of time, this year, next year, that we can get to the heart of this and preserve these families to the best extent possible. I know there's a rush to uh, permanency sometimes, trying to get it done within six months or a year, which is, flies in the whole face of all your traditions and the efforts. And so um, to the men and women who testified and the people watching at home, uh, I don't live in this world, but I really care. And um, for what part I can bring, I'm uh, happy to be a part of the solution. And so whatever you need, let me know what that is. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. I know you, you have been Senator a champion Hanesh. in the past. and. I know we can count on you to continue. Madam Chair, we have two more um, testifiers, if that's all right. Sure. Okay. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? And Yes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Sherry Johnson, and I am LH, 
a Leech Lake Band member, and also a coordinator and supervisor for the Indian Child Welfare Division of the Minnesota Guardian Ad Litem Program here at the State of Minnesota. Um, guardian Ad Litems are child advocates appointed to, by the court under the state and federal law in juvenile and family court matters to make recommendations to the court regarding the best interest of children who have experienced abuse and neglect. In response to significant disparities in out-of-home placement by Minnesota's American Indian children and in response to requests of our state's tribal governments and our tribal child welfare partners, the Guardian Ad Litem program began the creation of the Indian Child Welfare Division in 2020 to better meet the needs of the Indian children and Indian families who find themselves in the child welfare system. The Federal Indian Child Welfare Act and the Minnesota's corresponding state law, the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act, are critically important to laws and safeguarding the rights of Indian children and their families and tribes within the court systems. As a child advocate for the state of Minnesota, as an Ojibwe woman, mother, sister, auntie, uh, I have been and seen success impact both law and had made Minnesota Indian children our families and communities. Without these laws, our program is concerned that the significant disparities experienced by Indian children being removed and separated from their families would be even greater. Without these laws and protections they provide, we are concerned that Indian children would experience greater trauma, greater loss of identity, and a greater loss of cultural connection. The ICWA Division and the Guardian Ad Litem Program supports the proposed amendments to MIFPA because we believe they are the best interests of our Indian children, their families, tribal communities, non-tribal communities, and Minnesota as a whole. When the children we serve do better, our state does better. Thank you for your consideration. Voting yes for SF667. Thank you. Will the next testifier please introduce yourself and proceed? Uh, Buju, Jawan Obinesi, Kendijnakaz, Makwa, and Dudem, Sabakone, Zaga, Igening. My name is Bobby Joe Potter. I'm a citizen of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa, located in northern Minnesota, and I also have descendancy to the St. Croix Band of Chippewa in Wisconsin. Um, I'm really honored to be here today um, and thinking back to 1985 when there were grandmothers sitting at a table similar to this um, and advocating for me and people like me that they never met, that they never knew, that they were never going to meet. Um, and this reminds me of the unconditional love that my relatives and my ancestors have for, for all of us. Um, and as I, I'm reflecting on things, I think I'm... I was, what, one when MIFPA um, was, became law here in Minnesota, and the intent was to keep children um, connected, families connected to their tribal customs and norms and keep the tribal nations intact. And I thought, gosh, this hasn't really impacted me, but as I was preparing, um, MIFPA really has reconnected me back to my culture, not through placement or anything like that, but learning about the importance of the Indian Child Welfare Act and the Minnesota Indian Family Preservation Act um, has really taught me a lot and, and connected me to things that I would have never known because um, I've survived and my people have survived many years of genocide and intentional um, acts to remove that culture and those teachings from us. Um, I also think about uh, the importance of making sure that our children are able to stay connected and have their identity intact. And um, I have lots of relatives. I have two brothers. that because this country tried to remove us, they grew up not connected to their culture. And as a senior in high school, I was on the other end of those phone calls. 
And I remember my brother one time, because he didn't know who he was, he called and he was going to commit suicide. And I begged him not to, and he hit the center median on the freeway as we were talking. And so this law means so many things. But for me and my family and my children who I brought here today, who I also am getting because of MIFPA, I'm adopting or not adopting, but getting custody of my cousins. But this law is a matter of life and death because without our, our identity, we don't want to be here. We're not welcome here. Um, and as one of the little girls told me last night as she was trying to pump me up to come here and testify, she reminded me that I belong here. And when I think about the opportunities that our children have to be connected and learn their culture, it's because the grandmas and all the people all those years ago came here or they prayed for us. And now my daughter knows the things that I didn't know and that my mom didn't know. My mom is 65 years old. And she didn't learn this history until last night. And so when I leave here today, I'll be unpacking things with my family. <laughs> I work in this system. I'm a representative of Ramsey County. I'm the manager of the Indian Child Welfare Program, and I've spent over a decade doing this work. Um, when I first came into this work, lots of people didn't understand it, and the experience within the county systems was very oppressive. People didn't know the law. Lots of people have talked about this. Um, but when I first started, there was... Um, I could tell that this law, ICWA and MIFPA weren't valued. I could tell by the way people rolled their eyes. Um, I could tell when um, people talked about, oh gosh, we gotta involve the tribe. People don't understand why this is important. Um, I used to work for a place where people celebrated removal of children, not just indigenous children, but the removal of children. And so MIFPA is, is talked about as the gold standard because we as indigenous people believe in relationships and that's something that's important to all people. We have a right when we come here to know who we are, where we come from, who our family is and why we're here. And if we continue and you support MIFPA, other children that I won't ever meet, I'll never know will have the same opportunities that my daughter has today. And so I ask that you support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. I do, uh, I, I want to ask both of you to sign in if you haven't already done that, please. And then I believe there was one more testifier who wanted to speak today. If you could please introduce yourself, sign in. And begin. You can go ahead and we can sign in. Thank you. Buju, I'm Rebecca McConkey Green. Um, I have spent my entire career as an attorney working on Indian child welfare issues, and that's been for about the past 15 years. Um, I've worked as a tribal attorney, I have worked for a legal service agency that um, provides services to Indian families, and I had my own practice where I did both of those things. I served tribes and individual Indian people. I'm currently very honored to serve as a judge um, for the Leech Lake Band, and I'm very honored to be here today, and thank you for hearing the testimony. The, um, it was amazing to hear the testimony, um, and I'm very thankful to the people that were able to provide it. I wanted to clarify um, just a couple of things as we go forward. We, um, I worked on the work group of attorneys that put this legislation together, and we're very um, honored and happy that we had participation from other collaterals in the system. Um, in doing that, we had to scale back a lot of what we wanted to ask you to do today, and we scaled that back with the intention of having a work group that will work going forward. In fact, we're starting later this month to bring you some additional revisions next year. This year, all we did, we scaled everything back so that all we did is we codified what is in the Indian Child Welfare Act into Minnesota law so that if that fails based on anti-commandeering, that we don't lose the important protections that you heard people talk about today. We also did that because commandeering doesn't affect all of the statute. And the amount of litigation, if we don't have all of ICWA codified into Minnesota law, 
that we are likely to see if um, if ICWA is found unconst unconstitutional based on commandeering is going to be fairly enormous, I fear. And there's two problems with that. There is, of course, I think what flags for most people, the costs, right? But the costs are not just to the state and to the counties and to the tribes to litigate these issues. The costs, as you heard today, are extremely personal and long-lasting, and we can't have that happen. You also heard testimony today about the fact that We've had MIFPA since 1985, and we've had ICWA since, what was it, 1978. We still have absolutely egregious out-of-home placement numbers. We need to do this better. So all of those things that we pulled out to be protective right now, we're forming work groups, we're gonna work very hard to improve practice, and we will be back next year, because we just can't let this continue to happen. We need to be better. And so we hope that you will greet us warmly and with an open mind and heart next year when we come back with practice improvements. Um, and thank you very much for your time today. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that today uh, we have been given a little opening into the sl a sliver of the trauma that our Native communities have been enduring. And um, they're asking us to do the right thing today. And so uh, I hope that we can make some progress and do that. Um, Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And to the attorney, I'm sorry I didn't catch, please stay. I, I didn't catch your name, I'm sorry. But um, so uh, every, every bill has questions that are to it. And you can answer two that I have. And I'm asking this as a person friendly to what you're trying to do. Um, where the default goes to remaining with a tribal family, where the default goes to preserving the culture, just so you know. Um, so um, as I look on page uh, 20, uh, it talks about the, it seems, is this, is this stronger than what it has been? And I would not mind it if it were, but uh, lines 20.20 uh, 20 20 to 28, I guess. Um, and so on line 22, it says clear and convincing. So is that the current standard that they have to really try to, if, they have to really be convinced it's not going to work? Or is, that a, is the current standard a lower bar than that, that's in practice? So all of the standards that are in MIFPA are the same standards that are in the Indian Child Welfare Act. And so there's no change to practice at all. That's exactly the same standard. Yeah. So Madam Chair. And so, I mean, it just seems like we're not doing clear and convincing. It seems like the current practice has a lower standard than that, so I'm just happy to be told that's what you're trying to get at. But it just seems from all the places that said go out, um, with the, from the ranging from the qualified witness down to the, the standard that, um, I mean, it seems like too many children are not even, that's like the last, it just, it's not working out like what the law says. Is that true? I would agree <laughs> with that. I, I think there's really significant room for improvement in practice, and that, that's why we want to talk with everybody, um, all of our collaterals, and come back next year with, with some ways to improve that. And even if the Indian Child Welfare, and I'm hoping that the Indian Child Welfare Act remains in place, we're allowed to have greater protections at the state level um, for Indian children and families. And so we're hoping that we can develop that in a way that will greatly reduce what we're seeing and what we've seen over time as far as the out-of-home placement numbers and especially the permanency numbers and adoption numbers. Well, Madam Chair, I appreciate that. And I know we've uh, got training in place and if, there, if counties are just simply unaware of what they're required to do, but um, just if they could follow the law, that would be kind of a thought. I would just have one more question. Senator Abler. Uh, and it's on page four, the definition of imminent harm. Um, and what drives some of this quick stuff is that, that that's on line 4.24 to 4.26. Um, and what drives a lot of the permanency stuff is concern for the welfare of the child and, and so on. And is this the current standard? Because it's kind of a high standard. And I, again, if you're trying to keep more people with their family, then you have to have a really, really good reason to take them away. And so that this is the current standard and it's, it's a good one in your opinion? 
Yes, so if I could, um, the Indian ch this actual phrase, imminent physical damage or harm, comes directly out of the Indian Child Welfare Act. It comes out of the section that talks about emergency removals. And it's an extremely important phrase. Unfortunately, the phrase isn't defined. And so um, I want to talk, uh, to answer your question, if I may, first with making sure that um, there's an understanding that there are a number of provisions in the Indian Child Welfare Act that are designed to make sure that um, there are controls on the actors, that, that whether private or public agencies, that would remove children. And those include that there is supposed to be active efforts to try to keep the child in their home and with their family. There's supposed to be notice and consultation with the tribe. The children are only supposed to be removed um, if they would suffer serious emotional or, or physical harm after consultation with the tribe. In order to remove the child in an emergency, and it's important to be able to remove children in an emergency, nobody at the tribal level or the state or anywhere else wants to see an Indian child in danger. Nobody wants to see that. But we need to control when these provisions for um, imminent physical damage or harm or the emergency removal are used because of the fact that it allows you to bypass the active efforts to keep the family together. It allows you to bypass the notice to the tribe and to the consultation with the tribe about how can we keep this family together. So this particular area, this term, imminent physical damage or harm, is used in ICWA, but like a number of terms in ICWA, is not defined. We added the definition because we were seeing far too many situations where we would come into court um, without consultation of the tribe and notice, of course, had happened, but or we wouldn't have been there, but there, um, there were situations where we couldn't spot what the emergency was, yet they had acted as if there was an emergency and bypassed a number of provisions. So we want to tighten that up. If they have, you know, if there's not an actual emergency, then they have the time to go consult with the tribe. They have a the time to get the QEW testimony, and they have the time to start developing some active efforts to provide to the family. This um, language is important because it really limits the ability to bypass those things. Madam Chair. Thank you. Senator Abler. I really like it. I think that, for heaven's sake, follow the law, follow the intent. And I, th I think that, you know, defining that is going to help less of these uh, importune things that happen because people get nervous. And we've seen uh, this whole system, Madam Chair and members, has just been a challenge across every sector of the state. There's far too many permanency matters and it's it's just a I mean, it's a product of the times I guess but um, but I think you're on the right track and I, I remember I've I've had sub I've had meetings with large groups of people and they throw things at each other almost they get so so uh, wrapped up in their own opinions and I'm trying to find how do you pass a law on that how do you fix it and I think you're well on your way and so uh, highlighting these two elements, I think, uh, strengthens your argument and strengthens this bill. This is a really good bill. And I'm even happier that I authored it, co-authored it. Thank you. Thank you. Members, other questions? Uh, Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. I don't have a question, but just want to extend my gratitude to Senator Kunish for your work on this and bringing this bill, and to all who testified today for sharing your stories and your experiences and your testimony that was both painful and powerful. Um, I think this is a, an excellent example of why we all need to be taught and learn a, a true and accurate picture of history and American history. Um, I think there, it's, it's clear um, the, the current and generational trauma that this has caused and continues to cause is evident and is um, clear that action is needed. So um, thank you again for bringing this forward. Thank you. thank you, Senator. Seeing no further questions, um, Senator Bolden, would you like to move the bill? Yes, Madam Chair, I move that Senate File 667 be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. As, a, as amended. Sorry. As amended. Do you want me to re-say it? Uh, I move that Senate File 667, as amended, be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. 
Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The motion prevails. And the bill is moved on. Thank you so much for everyone to testify today. Uh, it was a very difficult day for a lot of people, and we, we appreciate you being here. Um, with that, members, we are adjourned. Well, we love.